Okay, good morning. Thanks everyone for coming. Our first speaker this morning is Emanuela Viola telling us about interleaved group products. Thank you. Uh, this talk is based on a couple of papers that are joined with uh, Timothy Gowers. I um, want to thank you for inviting me to this workshop. Uh, we have seen uh, lots of great talks on additive comedonics. Uh, however, this talk is going to be about uh, multiple. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, our setup is that uh, we have a group uh, that's going to be large, so all the results are going to be asymptotic with the size of the group, and we have a number k of high entropy distributions xi over the group. So by high entropy for this talk, you, you can just think of them being uniform over, say, 0.1 fraction of the entire group, OK? Um, these distributions are going to be independent at the beginning, and later we are going to throw in dependencies, OK? And our goal is to show that if you multiply the distributions together, then you get something which is very close to uniform over the entire group. Okay, so by multiplying, I just mean that you sample from each distribution and you output the product, or you take the convolution of the probability vectors. Okay, and by nearly uniform in this talk, uh, I'm going to mean uh, um, a strong L infinity type of property. I'm going to mean that uh, uh, every element in the group is output by the, is, is, is obtained by the product distribution D with a probability which is very close to 1 over the size of the group. So it's going to be 1 over the size of the group plus or minus epsilon over the size of the group. Okay, this is a very strong and infinite condition, which in particular implies uh, if you just sum over all group elements uh, a more, perhaps more standard, uh, a statistical distance bound. Okay, so this distribution is going to be epsilon close to uniform statistical uh, distance so over the group. Statistical distance is the same thing as L1 or total variation distance. Okay, so these things have uh, various applications in uh, group theory and in communication complexity. In fact, uh, I'm going to touch on the communication complexity uh, later. Okay. Uh, as a warm up, let's consider this uh, scenario. We just have two distributions, sex and y. Uh, they have high entropy and they are independent over the group. And the question is uh, uh, if you multiply x, y, do you get something which is nearly uniform over the entire group? And again, by nearly uniform, I mean the strong. And if bound, in particular, I want that the support of x, y is the entire space, the entire group. Um, do what do you think? Well, you could have subgroups, right? Um, yes, but uh, you can answer this question for any group uh, with a one-line argument, uh, regardless of whether you have subgroups or not. Okay. This, this, this just uh, like for us to you know, be on the same page. So that's a very simple answer, this. Uh, no, <laughs> exactly. No, so thanks, Madhu. So the answer is no. So um, yeah. So uh, take uh, take x uh, to be any any solution that you, that you want on 0.1 g fraction of the elements, uh, and you can just define b to have support, which is all the elements except the inverse of the support of x. Okay. So if you do this, uh, then when you multiply x y, you will never get uh, one in the loop, for example. This is because you are in L infinity, you know? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. yes, yes. So I'm, as I mentioned, I'm going to focus on the stronger infinite bound for now, which in particular implies okay. you're, one. You're really interested in the case where it's 0 0.1, not 0 0.6. Um, because 0 0.6 is good enough. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I want epsilon, but for simplicity, you, you can okay. think of 0 0.1. So it can so be you like. Want really small. Yes, yes, I want this to be small, but uh, yeah, less than half. Uh, uh, think of this epsilon, like, you know, 1 over 100 or 1 over a million. Okay, so we want this an infinite bound, and the answer here with the solution is always uh, no, regardless of, of the group. Okay. But is anybody? Okay, good. So now let's think of three distributions. Okay, so two don't work, let's think of three. So again, you have uh, uh, three solutions x, y, z, that are uniform over a constant fraction of the elements of the group, and they are independent. Do you get this L infinity uh, bound? And the answer here is more complicated. Okay, so this thing actually depends on the group. And uh, as Snogger was saying, uh, um, there are some obstacles. Okay, so if uh, what are the obstacles? So if you have a large subgroup uh, H, then of course I can define all my distribution to be uniform over H. And when you multiply, you just stay in H and you don't get this L infinity bound. This is one obstacle. 
And you know, uh, the other obstacle is uh, this workshop, right? Uh, you can have uh, things like, uh, uh, oops, uh, ZP, the integers mopping. Uh, this thing uh, doesn't have any subgroups, it's space prime, uh, but still it just, it's not good enough, right? So if you have uh, text to idea just over uh, you know, the first 0.1p elements, if you sum the three, you just get on the way to uh, 0.3p, which is not the entire group, okay? So this group doesn't uh, mix enough. Okay, so these are two obstacles, and you can ask, so what about other groups? Uh, and remarkably, for other groups, uh, the answer is yes, okay, so, so there is this result, um, which is in this paper by Gowers on quasi-random groups, uh, and there is also a paper in the computer science literature by Barbara and Nicole on uh, paper, which uh, they prove essentially the same thing, okay? Okay, so they prove that if you have, again, three distributions X, Y, Z, which are independent, and each of them has high entropy, uh, then when you multiply them, you, you get an error, which can be expressed in terms of the autonomic the distributions, which are, I don't care about, um, in this case of, of the high, high entropy. Uh, I just look at this bound here. So um, the bound is going to be D to, D to the minus half divided by G, where D, is the notion from representation theory is the minimum <coughs> dimension of a non-trivial uh, representation of the group. Okay, uh, I, I'm going to tell you in, in a second what there is, but uh, just to uh, remind you, so our error here is really d, d to the minus half. So the bounds that we're looking at is, is like epsilon over the size of the group, and, and here epsilon is, is exactly this uh, d to the minus half. Okay, so it's important what's d for us. So let's look at what uh, d is. Uh, so if the group is abelian, then D is 1, okay? So uh, you don't get anything from abelian groups, as you should, because uh, uh, they don't work. And uh, it's known that uh, for important class of groups, uh, which are the simple uh, non-abelian groups, uh, this D parameter C is uh, non trivial so it, it gets uh, about the square root log of the size of the group. So in this case, you get a non-trivial bound here, okay? Um, you mean, so sometimes you get much better. But it's the next, uh, thank you, yeah. Uh, so, but this is, this is like the worst possible that can happen for a, for a simple MA group, and, but, but there are groups which are much better. That's the focus of, of this talk. So uh, this group here, uh, <coughs> SL2Q, uh, is a group of two by two matrices uh, over a finite field with the mean to one. I'm going to define this group properly uh, later. So which groups would it say that by the square root group? It's like the, the alternating group. Can we see? What's that? group is more like log g over log g, Yes, yes, it's not exactly this. So I don't know exactly which group can mix this, but I think this is the best possible bound. But it, for an, it's very close to this, right? It's about, it's log n over uh, log log n. It's, it's not exactly this, but I, I don't know which group gives you this uh, square root. Uh, no. Not as much as What's that? None? Okay, so it's when it's not square root, maybe it's log. Okay. Okay, so let's, let's take this poly log G. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Anyway, it's about log G here, but it can be polynomial in the group. Um, um, maybe this thing is a type one, no? Um, anyway, so for this group, uh, SL2Q, uh, you get this one, and just to remind you, um, Again, this means that if you multiply x, y, z, you get something which is also uh, very close to uniform instantly second distance, okay, if you just sum over uh, group elements, yes. This could be a dumb question, but like, representations over what field? Um, let's go over the complex number, say, but uh, luckily, uh, representation theory will play no role in our, in our talk, which is, so, <laughs> this is, <laughs> so, you know, yeah, so, uh, I'm going to work on this later. Um, okay, so this is what was known, uh, this mixing in three sets, uh, um, it's a bunch of obligations, uh, you can find them in, in those papers. Um, and, and our work really starts with the, with the question, uh, what happens if you have dependencies in the distributions? Okay? It seems a much harder setting. So let's look at that. You still have three distributions, uh, A, Y, A prime, okay? but, but, uh, but they have this property. So um, A and A prime are sampled jointly. Okay, so A prime can depend on A, but together they are uniform over a large fraction of the pairs. Okay, so they are uniform over 0 0.1 fraction of the pairs of the group, so they have enough entropy. And the Y is, uh, is independent from the A's. 
Okay. So the first and the third are sampled jointly, and the middle one is independent, and they, and they all have a high entropy. Do you get mixing in this setting? And the answer is no. Okay. So you said it doesn't work. And, and uh, here's the answer. Here is the the example is very similar to the previous counter example. So let's take a uh, y to be uniform uh, over uh, some uh, 0.5 fraction of uh, the elements. Okay. And then uh, let's take a to be completely uniform uh, over the entire group. Okay. But then I'm going to sample a prime as follows. So I'm going to um, take. Uh, uh, all the elements except those which are in the support of, of a y times uh, um, the inverse of a with the, with the knowledge of the sample of, of a. Okay, this is exactly where a prime depends on, on a. Okay, it's exactly the, the same kind of example as v1. Uh, just uh, shifting the support of y by this inverse of a. Okay, so now a prime is clearly uniform over a large fraction of a. Uh, the pairs in the group, but uh, a y prime will never be equal to to one. Okay. Okay. So you get three distributions with these type of dependencies. It doesn't work. Uh, so what about four? Okay. And four, it does work. So our uh, first main result is that uh, if you have something like uh, a b a prime b prime, it actually does mix. Okay, so here uh, A and A prime are sampled jointly, B and B prime are sampled jointly, um, A and A prime are uniform over a large fraction of the pairs, same thing for B and B prime, and the only condition is that the DAs are independent from the Bs. Okay. Um, and the error bound that you get is one over the polynomial in the side of the group, and again, uh, all this is for the group uh, uh, SL to Q. Yeah. In particular, again, this is equation here, a, b, a prime, b prime is very close to uniform in statistical distance. Okay. So, um, along the way, um, we also get uh, reprove this x, y, z result, which I mentioned earlier, um, without, without even using the, the full power of, of this, uh, in the case of this group as L to Q, and uh, we also get a proof that does not use representation theory. Okay, so if you're interested in learning about the exercise result, you can find a proof here which uh, may be more accessible depending on what's your uh, background. And I want to make one comment about what happens for other groups. So we can also prove non-trivial bounds for any non-abelian simple group. Um, um, and then after our work, Shalev uh, uh, came up with a paper uh, that uh, gives uh, tighter bounds for uh, uh, for and simple groups. Okay, but I'm gonna discuss this more. Um, and this thing also scales uh, the way that you would like. So I just want to mention that uh, if you have uh, t tuples of A and t tuples of B, and you do this. Uh, uh, Ty is internally product, so a1, b1, a2, b2, a3, b3, and so on. Then again, you get mixing, and the error probability is going to be exponentially small in T, as you would like. Okay? Uh, it's a generalization of the previous uh, result. Is there any question about the sentiments? How yeah. does the point one, how does that affect this behavior? What's that? What's the dependence of Yes, so, uh, you know, there is a, this is epsilon, this thing, you know, loses by, you know, one or epsilon here, some of that. I mean, like, a problem. Is it clear that this thing should be monotoned in T? You know, I think you can just define uh, some distribution to be dummy, and then I guess you recover the T goes to case. Uh, Okay. Well, maybe if you fix A and B, or fix the. Okay, wait. Wait, what's the question? If so, so is it monotone and T? I mean, should things get better as T gets larger? Um, yeah, because you would Yeah. So, yeah, so, so anyway, one answer is that, uh, yeah, definitely a good point. Actually, this proof, uh, uh, if you just black box the real result, actually, I don't, I don't know 
how to get this. So it's not just boosting the previous result. Previous result. But actually, it, it requires a daily reading book. So that's the main it. So it may actually not be clear. So I, th I thought of what to cover, and um, I thought that because you know, it's early morning and everybody's fresh, actually, I'm going to hit you with the proof of, this, uh, of these results. And then, uh, um, and then actually, I'm going to relax and talk about the bit about com communication complexity and some connections, and, and everything's kind of easier. Uh, and then I'm going to try to, try to mention some of the results on, uh, about the boosting independence, uh, um, some other things that we obtain in this paper. OK. So now uh, I want to tell you what are the, the main ideas in this proof. So, and I'm going to focus on this uh, um, basic mixing result of uh, A, B, A prime, B prime, OK? So, um, okay, so uh, the one that I had before. So uh, central notion uh, in this study is that of a conjugacy class of the group, OK? So I'm going to have this notation uh, CG for a uniform element from the conjugacy class of G. Okay, so you take a uniform U and you sample U inverse G U in the group. Okay, so it's gonna use it extensively. And this result here uh, can be obtained by the combination of one lemma and the claim. So the lemma, which is specific to this group here, as I took you, is the following, that if you sample uh, two uniform elements from the group, then with high probability, um, the distribution CA times CB, which means that you get a uniform element from the conjugacy class of A, and you multiply it by a uniform element of the conjugacy class of B, it's going to be very close to uniform um, in L1 distance. Okay? So the conjugacy class are nice if you pick two random conjugacy classes. Okay? Then with high probability of this choice, if you pick random conjugates, uh, you get something which is very close to uniform over the entire group. And then there is another claim um, that if you prove something like this for any group, this or something else, you get this interleaved mixing. Okay? And I want to start by telling you about this claim here because I want to show you how conjugacy classes show up in this study, okay? because it may not be clear. Um, Okay, so let me try to uh, tell you about the proof of this claim. So uh, the first line is our hypothesis that with high probability over A and B in, in the group, the distribution of C A times C B is very close to G2 uniform. Okay, so conjugacy classes are nice in the, in the sense. Then I get this mixed result. Then if A prime uh, uniform over large fraction of pairs, and the same for B and B prime, uh, then A, B, A prime, B, B prime uh, has this nice uh, uh, element in the uh, bound. Okay? So for simplicity, I'm going to think of uh, A and A prime and B and B prime being uniform over the same set S, uh, which let's say has an alpha fraction of the pairs. Okay. So this definitely does not work for any signature, right? Because they are very small conjugacy classes. Yes, yes. So this, this is specifically yeah. for so this this claim, this implication holds a frame. So if you give me any group on which you can group. Yes. But the hypothesis is uh, very specific, and I'm going to in the next slide I'm going to tell you how you get it. This slide here works a friendly group. So if you have some other crazy little group, uh, you can still prove, if you can prove this thing of conjugacy classes. Okay? Um, and OK, so I just want to, to get you a sense of how the conjugacy classes arise. So let's see. So this is what we want to bound, OK, is the difference within the probability of hitting, let's say, one, the one element in the group, and uh, one over the size of the group. I, I can always reduce to just hitting one, because you can shift the distributions by one fixed group element. OK? So first thing that I'm going to do, um, so here, actually, this distribution is, is sampling from A's and B's and checking what's the interleaved product. First thing I'm going to do, I'm going to use a Bayes rule and uh, turn things around. And actually, I'm going to think uh, instead of sampling a uniform um, uh, quadruple uh, whose product is 1, okay? and then checking uh, if the quadruple falls in the support of the A's and the B's. Okay, so the expectation of this quadruple U, B, U prime, D prime, such that the, the product is equal to one, and then you check if the first and the third, the U and U prime, 
following the support of the ASOG, which is S, and also uh, the second and the fourth following the support of B, which is S, okay? and this thing now should be compared uh, not to one over G, but to the, the but to alpha square, which is you know, the square of the, of the density of, of S. Okay, so, and there is some normalization here, which is, which is uh, very important. You just want to know that the distance here is small. Okay. So, um, so because uh, if you just look at two coordinates, uh, uh, they are uniformly distributed over this choice. Uh, you can write alpha as the expectation over the set S. Okay. And you can pull out this S here. Okay, and you are you're left with uh, the expectation of B and phi prime of you know, S, B, and phi prime times the expectation over U and U prime of the distance within alpha and S, U and U prime. I'm not expecting everybody to follow every line of, of this, but uh, I would get a sense of why conjugacy classes arise, and, and it's exactly here. At this point, I can do Cauchy Schwartz. Okay? And when you do Cauchy Schwartz, uh, uh, this stuff here goes away, it's not important. You're going to square the inside. Okay, when you square the inside, it means that the Q sem, okay, so you get uh, expectation of square over the U and the U prime. And this alpha becomes alpha square. Okay, and here's, here's where the things happen. So if you square this, it means that you sample twice u and u prime. So you sample once u prime, and then you resample them. Let's call them x and x prime. But the v's have not changed. Okay, so you get the two quadruples, where uh, uh, the v and the prime have the same, and the first and the, and the third have changed. They've been sampled twice, and both the quadruples should multiply to, to one. Since both the quadruples have a v prime in the end, which is uniform, it's the same thing as asking that the, the first three of each quadruple actually have the same product. Okay. So the condition is that the u v u prime is equal to x v x prime. Okay, and this condition here, um, you know, can be written also as uh, x prime uh, is equal to v inverse some stuff here v in u prime. So because I have uh, uh, v inverse and v, this means that I'm taking a uniform conjugate of this element uh, here. Okay? And this point is, is exactly where conjugate classes arrive. If you do cauchy schwartz you just resample uh, uh, some portion of this. And because of something is, is both in the, in the two sides of the equation, then you get a uniform conjugate. Okay? So, um, okay, so Summing up, uh, basically you're looking at this type of random walk uh, here um, over pairs of the group. You have a u and u prime, and to take a step, you do the, the following thing. You multiply the first coordinate by uniform element x, and the second coordinate is going to be multiplied by a uniform conjugate of x. What you're trying to show is that this, this random walk over pairs of the group uh, has very good heating properties. Okay? It's kind of like an expanded walk over pairs of the, of the group. Okay? Um, so it's going to hit uh, you know, SS, which is probably very close to alpha square. Okay, and the last step to tie it to our uh, hypothesis uh, um, is that uh, um, you, know, you can actually analyze two steps of this walk. Uh, if you do two steps, uh, you multiply the first coordinate by xy, and the second by conjugate of x times the conjugate of y, which is exactly our hypothesis, uh, and, and you get to what you want. Okay, so uh, is there any question? So right, I mean, I think you've seen it. You know, you've seen this. You know, this is like Bayes, Cauchy Schwartz, and this is what's going on. Okay, so there's nothing really, but at least you see you get a sense of where conjugate classes arise. Um, so I think it was useful, even though you know, of course, it's very fast now. Though these steps and these equations, um, and. I want to spend some time now on how we prove uh, this slam of a conjugacy class in this specific uh, form for uh, the group. Okay, so the result is that, uh, again, uh, if you sample uh, AB over the group, uh, then CA, CB, uh, CA times CB is uh, close to uniform over the entire group. Um, so actually, for all, for all uh, uh, our results except this one uh, of mixing four tables, uh, you actually get a stronger condition. 
um, which, in which A and B are sampled in a more complicated fashion. Um, but the proof that I'm going to give you actually can be modified to, to get that. Okay, so this, I guess this goes back to the question. That even if I like for the longer tablets, actually I don't know how to basic test on this. I will uh, study from it, which, which allows me to reiterate over for longer tablets. Um, okay. So a first observation is that um, if you have something like C A times C B, actually uh, you can you can take one extra conjugation for free. Okay. Um, so the definition of this for fixed A and B just from the choice of the conjugate is the same thing as you do that, and then you take one more conjugation. Is it just it's just it's just one line proof? Um, but it's very useful because that means that all I have to show is to show that uh, C A C B is every conjugate class with the right probability. Mixing inside the class is for free for us. Okay, and we just have to show that you hit every conjugate class with the right probability. Thanks to this fact here. And now I can tell you about the conjugacy classes of SL2Q. Uh, so this is you know, SL2Q11. Uh, so SL2Q is the group of two bad over uh, connected the Q with the real uh, one. Okay, so think of them a matrix like this so with AD minus BC equal to one. And this group uh, um, is extremely nice. In this sense, okay, so you can uh, essentially, after all over the terms, uh, you can think of this as having uh, Q cube elements, having uh, Q, Q, Q conjugacy classes, and every class has size Q square. Okay, so some classes to be, to be dropped, and it's actually Q square, it's like Q square up to a little bit, but, but there is this very nice uh, uh, structure, so the group is partitioning the um, uh, huge classes, okay, uh, and uh, they all have the same size. Of course, you know, the class of one just a size one, but if you drop that and a few others, then actually you get, get this. Um, so we need to hit uh, uh, conjugate classes with, with, with the right probability, and because of this, uh, you really just want to show that you get a uniform class, okay? because all the classes have the same size. Okay, and the next thing that you can use, uh, um, which is used in a number of papers in this uh, genus area, is that the uh, conjugate classes are in uh, almost one-to-one -one co correspondence with the, the trace of the matrix. So trace of the matrix is just A plus D. This is, this is an element in the field, and basically tells you what conjugacy class uh, this matrix uh, belongs to. Okay. So we have put all this uh, together, all that we have to show is that uh, for typical A and B, the trace of C A C B is um, uh, a nearly uniform field element. Okay. Over, the, uh, yeah, over the field. Okay. And I'm going to spend like a couple of more minutes. Yes. Yeah. The little lays and the last lines are. Uh, no, no, these are just the field elements. The, the next slide. Or next slide? Yeah. These are the basis. Okay. Yes. Yes. Sorry, yeah. These are the basis in the group. Thanks, sorry. Okay, so how do we show that? So um, I'm just going to uh, basically flash a couple of slides uh, so um, we don't get into much. Also, so um, you can basically sit down and write down the trace of an expression like C A C B, and then you get a very nasty, ex a very nasty looking ex ex expression, uh, which is a um, it's a polynomial in the entries uh, for these conjugates, um, subject to the condition that the determinant is uh, one. Okay. And you can do some manipulation, uh, and you can just basically reduce this to a, to a polynomial, which gets even next there. Okay, so 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 you're looking at the trace of C A and C B, and actually this thing has the same distribution as the trace of A C B because the <coughs> trace is a shifting variant. So so actually you just have uh, one conjugate because you're looking at the trace, so you can just look. and so this trace is you know this is A. This is uh, 
this is a new stuff, but this, this, this comes uh, from the country here. This is a B, and this is a uh, comes from the country. So the, the UIs are the entries of the matrix, uh, which uh, gives this uniform country. So you get the polynomial in this use. Okay. It's long polynomial. And it has this condition that um, the determinant is one which was very known to me uh, because it's not clear what you can do. But you can multiply this and you can you go back to a polynomial, um, which, 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 which is more complicated, uh, but does not have this uh, condition. And the bottom line is that you just need to show that this polynomial here um, has an output the distribution of a uniform field element, so it is very close to uniform over the field. Okay, and how do you show that? How do you show that the, the polynomial in three variables is very close to uniform over a fine field? Who knows? So, so this, is, this, is actually, this is actually a classic um, uh, you know, endeavor in, uh, in algebraic mm -hmm. geometry. So, so there are these bounds by Lang Bale, uh, which exactly tell you um, we just need to tell you how to show that the polynomial is um, nearly uniform over a fine field, as long as you show that the polynomial is irreducible over, a, over any field extension. Okay, so what we show is that, uh, is that our polynomial, uh, if you take our polynomial, and uh, I guess I don't often understand this, but I think I'm, 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 I'm losing some people. But uh, so this bounds really tell you uh, what's the number of the roots. So we look at our polynomial minus a shift, which is, uh, is, uh, it, co it corresponds to the polynomial output in this value. And we want to bound how many roots this polynomial has. And we apply the long veil uh, there. So we, we show that for most values of the shift, the polynomial shifted by this S is absolutely irreducible. And then we apply the long veil and we get what we want. And that's, that's the end. This part of the paper uh, um, is, uh, is quite technical, in my opinion. Uh, so it's very low-level uh, equations to show absolute uh, irreducibility. Basically, you set all, the, all these equations of what it would mean for this to factor and show that this thing is impossible. It, it requires like with substitution. There's like you know, some periods of substitution uh, which are not very happening, but uh, I, I don't know of the different ways, like you know, 20 equations. For these coefficients, but uh, in the end, it, it, uh, it works. And you only needed A and B to come from the big uh, conjugate stresses? Or? Okay, sorry, what's that? You, you only needed A and B to come from the big Yes, so in, they, they, exactly, yes. So uh, in this, so um, in, in this expression of the trace, uh, you know, we use that uh, the A's and B's are actually nice. So we avoid, you know, the the one case, the case or, or the, the residual classes. Yes. So there's a, so this polynomial has some conditions on the A's and the B's, you know, depending on. So you show that you know for um, for typical A and B's, this polynomial is nice enough that you can apply the Lang veil. And the reason you have three variables at the end, x, y, z, is because the c1, u2, u3, u4 yes. uses two. Yes, exactly. So you really have a polynomial over these four things subject to this condition, and you can uh, remove one variable of your substitution. Um, then you can multiply to remove the denominator, and you get some nasty looking expression. Uh, and this just becomes a polynomial over three variables. And the veil bound typically talks about two variable equations? No, so the, the veil bound, so the long veil bound is a generation to have a number of variables. So okay. the original thing were all curves sort of two variables. So, but uh, the long veil bound is this uh, classic result, algebraic uh, uh, geometry, that uh, a number of variables uh, can end up with just need three. And the G is uh, a polynomial in a fixed number of variables, fixed coefficients. Degree. Like it's a yeah, it's a fixed polynomial, but uh, you know that. So the, the you know the coefficient of the polynomial depends on these a and b's, uh, which so which so you prove uh, that you know you argue that you know for typical choices of a's and b's, the coefficients are nice enough that you can apply the long bound. So this this stuff uh, for me was uh, was very technical, and I spent like I cannot tell you how many days actually going through these equations. Um, I see. So, so you're not proving for every A and B, no. but for the most A For the fourth, actually. So, because I can take one here, you know, uh, just one, one, zero, zero, and it should really work. So only for most values of that, the problem is nice enough that you can do the language bound. But uh, um, so you could look at for 
tournaments and nine variables. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you know, um, so I will be happy if there was like a simpler way of doing this, but uh, uh, some things like this I've done uh, in many of these papers uh, on studying uh, SATOQ. Uh, look at trays and get, they get some very complicated expressions, so maybe it's not completely unusual. Um, but, yeah. Great. Uh, so that's the end of the group. So we have these two claims. Uh, the last one was this lemma about the conjugacy classes uh, behavior. And again, we actually need a slightly stronger conditions for our results, but you can modify this, this framework and, and get it for that. Uh, okay, so, so now, <laughs> now we can relax a bit, hopefully. Uh, so I want to tell you about some of this communication complexity viewpoint uh, um, for a couple of reasons. One, because uh, it, kind of like, uh, it tells you how you can try to extend uh, these results. Uh, so first, uh, I, I'd like to basically restate uh, our results uh, in terms of communication complexity. In fact, uh, um, communication complexity is the framework in which uh, these questions were asked in a paper with my student uh, Gmiles for an application in cryptography, which then actually turned out to be possible because of this fact here. So let's think uh, just of communication complexity for a second. So there is a Alice gets uh, as input the tuple uh, of length t of elements uh, from the group. And Bob also gets a double uh, of elements uh, from the group. And they want to decide if the interleaved product, uh, a1b1, a2b2, dot a d d t, is equal to either 1 in the group or to some other fixed sign. So their problem is that uh, it's, either, it's either equal to 1 or h, and they want to know which k is of the two could be. OK? Um, so the communication, the, uh, the, so they're going to ex exchange bits, so the communication complexity, and they're allowed for uh, randomness, shared randomness. Also, uh, the communication is going to depend on the group. So if the group is a B, then how much communication do you, do you need? Awesome, thank you. Good. So it's constant for, for a billion groups, right? So how does that? We can actually just have two elements because you, you can swap things around. It's just a times b is equal to one, to one, and they can they can check that with uh, um, with the quality protocol. Alice just sends you know constant number of bits which are the hash of its element, and Bob just checks you know if that, that corresponds to the, to the inverse of b. So you're talking about randomized. Yes, randomized. Yeah, shared randomized. Okay. So it's a, a general thing. So if G is non solvable okay, this is, uh, you can actually do things, uh, you can use uh, ideas like Barrington and use the previous result in combination complexity to get an omega P bound, okay, which draws you with the, with the length of the, ta with the tuple. And if you look at the, at this bound, so you think, well, I mean, they don't depend on the group, right? That's very I mean, If the group is bigger, it should get harder for them. It should mix more if you look. And this it was really our, you know, our question in this, uh, in this uh, paper. And the stuff that I just told you about is equivalent uh, to showing this, so that uh, for the group uh, SL to Q, the communication is theta t times log the size of the group. Okay, so uh, you get this extra factor log the size of the group, which is tight, because Alice can just communicate uh, uh, you know, the input. So this is equivalent to some average case communication no. complexity? No. This is, this is just equivalent. Uh, um, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So the parties have, have randomness. So it's. Uh, yeah. So this is just equivalent to the previous thing. Uh, but now that you think of it in this way, you can think of ways in which you can extend and. Uh, Communication complexity has many frameworks that allows for that. So the nicest one is this uh, number on forehead setting. So here, uh, like Alice doesn't have uh, one input in the hand, but has input on the forehead. So she can see there are three parties right here. She can see the other two uh, parties' inputs, but not their own. Okay. So specifically, um, let's say that there are three parties, uh, uh, Alice, Bob, and Cleo. So Alice gets a t tuple of group elements on the forehead, and she can see b and c. Bob gets b1, b, b t on the forehead, and he can see a and c, and Cleo gets c, and she can see the a and b. Okay? 
And then they look uh, at the what you can call the threefold interleaved product. So this is uh, a one b one c one a two b two c two. So a lot of ABD, CD. And again, you just want to do distinguish if it's equal to one or H for some fixed one <coughs> and H. And then you look at the combination complexity in this, uh, in this model, which is known to be very challenging. Uh, if the group is a bigger than, uh, and what's the com the combination? Uh, no, but this, this is randomized. So then, so it is only for deterministic. Ah, uh, right. So, okay. What's the combination? So it's three. It's three it's, it's, it's constant, right? So it's a constant if the group is a B, and they can just, uh, um, it's only three elements, but uh, Alice knows about the B and C, so she can multiply B and C in general, and then it's just equality. But for the realistic, it's hard. For the realistic, it's hard. Yes. yes. Uh, in fact, so yeah, we, we even get some slight, I think, some. Some slightly stronger bound for the, the deterministic case can be obtained from this, but I'm not talking about that. Um, okay, so if G is non solvable, um, there is this uh, uh, Baba and Nisa and uh, from you know, classic result in this uh, area, which together with this uh, from Barrington um, can get a bound of T over 2 with K. Okay? And this is the strongest uh, known bound in combination complexity. T over exponential in the number of parties. And, and again, these bounds don't depend on the size of the group, uh, and we wanted something which depends on the size of the group. In fact, uh, our application really relied on the multi-party setting. Um, and then eventually we were able to get something uh, in the setting. So in this work, uh, um, we can prove uh, this bound here. So it's uh, T over 2 to the 2 to the K. However, it's times log the size of the group. Okay, so we get this log the size of the group. So if k is constant, this band is tight. It's t times log the size of the group, and the dependence on k is worse than that. Um, and I'm going to tell you some, some ideas that uh, go into this, uh, but before that, uh, I want to make two conjectures. Um, so the first conjecture is that uh, you can actually improve this to do t over 2 to the k log g. Uh, and this will match uh, you know, this uh, Baba and Isa and result. But in, in addition, uh, you will get this log g factor. Uh, and I think, you know, I think it would be, uh, would be good to have, but uh, I'm going to make a much bolder conjecture <laughs> that uh, this thing actually is going to stay hard even if k gets larger than the log t. Mm. Why not? So, <laughs> so um, this is also you know, to communicate to other people about this condition. <laughs> so this is a, it's a fundamental barrier in communication complexity, and not so I understand in uh, some areas of communalics uh, that um, uh, you know you don't know how to prove things uh, when k is longer than the log of the of the length of the tuple, and we think you know it might be the case here. So uh, this may be extremely hard to prove, however, I think it's useful to have this conjecture around because uh, we have very few uh, candidate hard functions, so RAS has one, uh, but this one is different and uh, it has more structure, so it may be helpful to it around, and maybe uh, you, know, you may use it for reductions and for prior things. Uh, we should also think, you know, if you can think of any upper bounds on this. I don't know of any, of any actually upper bounds on this. Like, can, you, you know, can you rule out the T over K? You know, T over two. I, I don't know. Uh, uh, I don't know how to how even do that. Okay. So uh, last few minutes, I want to tell you some of the ideas that go into into this. Um, so, um, so the proof of this uh, this last result, the, this multi-party overbound, uh, relies. Or a lemma that we call boosting independence, okay, which uh, is perhaps more uh, pure math uh, framework. Okay, it says the following thing. So, um, so you have a bunch of distributions d1, d2, uh, ds over uh, any tuples of group elements, and the condition these, these uh, distributions are are independent. And the condition that you have is that each distribution by itself is pairwise independent, which means that if you look at two entries, 
in the distribution that they are uniform over pairs of the group. But the entire distribution can be very far from uniform over n tuples. Okay? So you have a bunch of distributions, they are independent, and over each, each distribution is over n tuple. And if you just look at two elements of the distribution, they are uniform over pairs. Okay? Then what you get is that if you multiply these distributions together, you go from two wise, from pair wise to n wise independence. Okay, the product distribution will be very close to uniform uh, uh, over the entire m tuple. Okay, so you boost the two wise uh, to n wise independence, and this is also one thing which is completely false for abelian groups. Okay, you can count with abelian group for which this thing doesn't work, uh, and you know, uh, you know, s has to be large compared to n, but only depending on m. It doesn't depend on the size of the group. Uh, it has to be, you know, something like it exponential in uh, EDN, which is where uh, our previous loss of the 2 to the 2 to the K multi-particle over bound arises. Okay. Um, so maybe this is also true with S equal to P. Yes. So uh, uh, one question is, what's the minimum S that you can put here to get the single thing? That's S. So let's say N is 3, and you want to go from pairwise to tripwise independence. What's the minimum S? Like, Two, three, I don't, we don't know the negative result. Um, what's the smallest cost that, that you can get here? Um, and just one word. Um, so, the way in which we arrived at this is actually by looking at the multi party lower bound result. So, for the multi party lower bound, uh, um, you analyze it uh, with this thing called the box norm, uh, which is common in combinatorics and also in a com com combination complexity. And we realize that uh, if you look at the box norm of the group products, uh, then you get the distributions, um, you get products uh, which are pairwise independent. So you can just kind of execute uh, here to, to can check uh, uh, that um, the box norm gives you things which are pairwise independent. Uh, because you can like, you change one coordinate in each copy. And so th that's really the only thing that, uh, um, that we could see from that. And then that should turn out to be sufficient for uh, for the result. And um, so just I'm just going to flash uh, the, the proof of uh, this. Um, so it turns out that actually that you can prove this thing just uh, Using the interleaved the mixing result, which I mentioned earlier. Okay? And you can prove uh, that uh, every time you throw in one more distribution, uh, the, the, the product gets closer to uniform. Okay? And I'm just, I'm just flashing this, I don't expect you to read it, but basically, you, 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 you can add down what happens to, to the product, uh, and with some regression, you can rewrite it as an interleaved mixing uh, condition for some other uh, fun functions, uh, and then you can apply the previous result. Okay? Um, and yeah, I think I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Questions for Emanuele? Um, so do you expect these results for SL2 to, to generalize to Yes, so, um, right, so all these things are generalized. So we had, um, we had these non trivial results for any numerable and simple group, um, which, which give like some, some non trivial bounds, and then Shalev has this paper after our work in which he gets. So he can show, he can show basically everything I said, he can make it happen for any little group of bounded rank. He can get exactly the same result up to up, up to constant, and then he has you know weaker weaker results for like kn, so he gets like a tight quantitative result for these things. However, so his proof uh, uh, to me is very hard because I mean he builds on like you know ten papers, uh, half of which are by himself and half of which are by people, and throwing on stuff. So it's completely um, it's very hard for, like, for me to kind of figure out what's going on. Um, but uh, yeah, he can get it. Groups. Like, like our proof, uh, the, uh, it seems to me it's a bit more self contained. I mean, you just look at the conjugacy classes and you prove these things about them, while he relies on a bunch of other papers uh, on group theory. But, 
uh, for the communication complexity results? Is uh, SL2Q as good a group to consider as any other? It's, it seems it's a group that gives the, the tight, uh, tight over about communication complexity, yes. So there's, it gives you a peel of genes like but also the future ones, the ones which are conjecture. Oh, yeah, yeah, so good, yeah. So that, the one we, we don't know for, for so for the multi party question, yeah, that. Uh, um, so it's, it's a question very for someone in the audience. So I think SL2Q is considered to be like the least a million group, or is that correct? Or is that something even, even worse than. Uh, uh, does, does anyone know? Do you know that? I, I think there's. Um, What's that? It's not a thing. I don't know what this. Um, I think that if, if you define how billion it is by sort of non dimension of the lowest representation over the normal size of the group, I think that the worst value is the Okay. Is this a well, I a, a, a a twisted value to think? Does it have a name? Uh, it does, but yeah. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. More questions? Okay, thanks so much. Right, thank you.